Welcome to the Lindsay Hadley Podcast Show. I'm coming to you from the North Shore of Oahu, where weekly I interview some of the world's most inspiring people from business, philanthropy, and entertainment. I love collecting humans, and these are some of my favorites I've found along the way. This podcast is brought to us by Capita Financial Network. Do you need help with the next steps of your financial plan? Think Capita. Capita is a financial network built around you. They have a team of financial advisors, CPAs, state attorneys, Medicare providers, and social security experts to help you accomplish your financial goals. Call or schedule a complimentary consultation at 801-566-5058 or visit their website at capitafinancialnetwork.com. You can also check out their financial education podcast, The Financial Call, available on Apple, Google, Spotify, and YouTube. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Lindsay Hadley Cast Show. Today, I'm super excited to introduce my guest, Jacqueline Samira, who's based out of Austin, Texas. She's here today to share with us her journey as a professional. And I'm super excited to actually hand over the time for Jacqueline to give us a little introduction. Why don't you tell, share with our listeners a little bit about you and what got you here and how we can get to best understand you know, your journey? Of course. So nice to meet you. Hi, everyone. I am Jacqueline Samira. I'm the founder and CEO of Howdy.com. Howdy.com is disrupting the talent management and sourcing ecosystem. Uh, we connect top individuals in Latin America with U.S. companies. Um, we were recently valued at over $105 million. And um, most recently, I have raised over $21 million for my company. So it's been a wild, wild ride. A lot of fun. We started. I started the company in 2018. Unbelievable, Jacqueline. So, okay, this is super exciting for me because my background is in philanthropy and social impact. And there's an amazing book that was written by a professor from Harvard called um, Clayton Christensen. And he talks about the prosperity um, paradox. And the idea is to, that, you know, using private sector thinking, creating jobs essentially is the answer to addressing poverty um, economically. So there's huge job shortages in the developed world. And I spent a lot of years doing different types of philanthropy, um, aid driven, you know, where we come in and feed people and, and relieve and pay for free school and all these types of boots on the ground, traditional aid development work. And I've never seen greater scale or greater impact to like lift, you know, the bottom billion then in creating commerce and business and opportunity for growth in the free market. I'm really a big believer in this. So I think it's really studying what you're doing. What got you to build this company? What was your journey that made you say, hey, and why South America? Do you have like, what are your ties there too? Yeah, great question. So, and it, um, thank you so much for sharing the background about yourself because I didn't know that either. I think we have a lot of similar desires and how we want to help society in the way that we think about it because I can tell you, uh, I, gosh, I graduated university in 2008. I was going to go into finance. Um, there was the housing crisis. It was very hard to get a job in banking at the time. So I just went into sales. Um, that windy road led me to Austin, Texas and leading sales teams for tech companies. Fast forward to 2017, 2018, so much capital was moving into the city, was moving to the great state of Texas because we're so business friendly. And it started to create this like disproportion of the amount of demand for strong technical talent and the actual supply of, you know, very experienced software developers. While I was leading the sales teams for these high growth startups, it was becoming increasingly more challenging to retain top talent or to even source for it. Because if you weren't a FANG company offering $500,000 compensation packages, you couldn't keep them and it was impossible. And then it created this very toxic culture where like 75% of the company was working really, really hard and really crazy hours. And then you've got your team of developers that are very small, overworked, but they know that they could jump ship at any moment because everybody was just writing plain checks to them. And that was a very frustrating experience for me and a first frustrating experience for startup founders who work so hard to raise capital, get their initial seed funding or their Series A or their Series B, and they think they've got the answers to now go build the team and they can't do it. Um, now, my background is my mom is actually a computer engineer from Iran. And she immigrated here during the revolution. And so I grew up knowing that, like, there are smart people all over the world. Now, I know that that's like a very basic thing to say, but I think there are some people that think, oh, no, here in the U.S., we must know everything. We must have all the answers. Like, we invented technology. We invented software. Well, in fact, it was invented in tandem with a lot of people all over the world. 
And so I knew that there were excellent, experienced, tenured software developers all over the world. And at the time, I was just looking for the solution. And the solutions that existed were in Eastern Europe, were in India, were in Asia. But for a, a small startup, the most important thing was communication overlap and making sure that you worked in the same time zones. And so I was specifically looking in South America because there's a lot of overlap in time zones. And there was no solutions in South America that matched what a tech company needed. And so I was like, this is a very silly problem to have. And wow, look at all of this opportunity here. And how many people in South America would be just so excited for this opportunity, would be desperate for this opportunity, or, and are sitting there not having that chance or not having that bridge to connect to that. So that was the start That's, of the journey. That is really amazing. I love that you shared that assumption that people often have, because I'm always shocked as well because of my extensive, um, basically privilege to have been able to travel the world. I've, I've, I've traveled to over 50 countries. I lived in several countries, um, five different countries now over my um, lifetime. And as I've, as I've really um, come to understand it, you're so right. There's such a parochial mindset often in the U.S. economy and even very educated, very engaged individuals will sometimes make these grand assumptions. And it's like, no, you just have to know where to find the people. And there, we often call it like the missing middle because there's people at extreme wealth, which we know like the oligarchs of a lot of developed world countries, you know, there's a lot of like tycoons. And then there's of course, those living in abject poverty and extreme poverty. But the missing middle is the group that actually like where the economies are built on, just like in the, in, in the West, right? And so um, I think it's really stunning that you that you pointed that out and just said, hey, that sounds like a really stupid, you know, uh, observation that everyone should just know inherently, but they don't. And so this is a great way to reeducate. And, and I'm super grateful for the Internet and people like you that, that kind of help get us more exposed, you know. So tell me a little bit uh, about your process of how you recruit and then who your clients are, because um, this is just ultimately matchmaking, I would imagine. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's technical matchmaking. Here we go. Um, so I, you know, a lot of the companies that existed at the time were what is known as outsourced product development. That's where you basically throw your product over the fence or you throw your idea over the fence to a company where you say, I want to build this app or I want to build this thing. Go build that thing for me. And then the people do the requirements. They ask all the questions. They use their team. They build it then for you. I was working for tech companies. What do, what do tech companies do? They build technology. They build web products. They, they're not going to want to throw that over the fence. Where they needed yeah. help was really just having the experienced individuals to join their team so that they can, you know, have success with their product roadmap. When I first started, the only, the only other solution then was also if you wanted to go to like Upwork or TopTow and hire freelance workers. Now, there's a huge difference between a core product team member and a freelance worker's. A freelance worker is somebody that's really good at building project-based things, working independently, but not necessarily like thinking of the whole scope. And they're not necessarily a holistically minded and product-oriented developers. And so there was a huge gap missing in the in the market for tech companies at the time. When I went down, I we actually have seven offices now throughout South America. But when I started, um, I went to a couple different cities in a couple different countries just trying to find the engineer that closely resembled an Austin software developer. And also I wanted to be in a territory that was not as intimidating for me, who was bootstrapping this business by myself that also didn't speak Spanish at the time. And um, after visiting several different countries, there was a lot of aspirational places I wanted to be. But the one that felt right was in Montevideo, Uruguay. Uruguay is a oh. very small country. Um, there's, I think, like 3 million people in total in this city. Most of the folks are in Montevideo, the capital city, which is around 2 million. The vibe, the city, except for the fact that it's on the ocean, felt very similar to Austin. And it has the strong, that country has the strongest middle class in South America. Actually, might even have a stronger middle class than the United States right now. Don't quote me on this. I need to check. But 80% um, of the population speaks English. Uh, a huge, vast majority of them have their master's degree. It is a very, very educationally minded, very strong middle class economy. And they had a lot of resources and they had a lot of uh, trade agreements with the United States at the time, especially with software services. And they have a couple of universities there that have been around for a very, very, very long time. And so long story short, it was the least intimidating place to start. Found the developers that 
that matched. And then I was the connector. But I realized very quickly that people wanted to work for a local company. They wanted the national benefits. They wanted the social care, everything that the government does. And so I was like, oh, shoot, I've got to now set up a foreign entity. So I did that, hired the people under that umbrella. And that's what kind of started to change our business model, change the way that we were thinking. And then companies were hiring me, yes, like a matchmaker, but then also to carry through with being their international employer of record. So we were doing payroll, wow. we were doing clients, we were doing benefits, we were doing all of these things. But it gave us a better, wow. it's, right? It's crazy. We do a lot of stuff. Um, that knowledge gave us insight into what made the teammates in South America excited about sticking around. And so we got so much data and an incredible amount of knowledge to help inform future decisions as well that also helped us with recruiting. So it's kind of wow. in this fly well. Yeah, Jacqueline, that's cool. I never thought of like the idea that you'd have to become your own entity to provide all of those, um, you know, domestic corporate um, resources and benefits. I mean, that makes so much sense. And I bet that is such a, so you're, it, that's probably a huge service to both the employer and the employee. So is Howdy um, currently employing people from South America? Like are your own employees based in Texas or are they, you know, are they <laughs> yes. also in South America? We, um, the expression in tech is to dog food your own product. We dog food our own product. Yeah. So I, yeah. I want 97% of everybody that works for Howdy is not in Austin. It's in, in South America. My co-founder and I are here in Austin. Um, we have our head of finance here in Austin. We have a salesperson here, an account manager here, and that's about it. And, and, and an assistant. Everybody else, our head of marketing, our head of operations, our head of engineering, our head of product, our, and then everybody underneath them all in South America. Incredible. That's really cool that you guys eat, that you eat your own dog food. <laughs> Just if the dog wants to eat, it's dog food, but also eat, eat it yourself. I think that's very true and, and memorable because if you're not using your own product, then how can you actually understand what the pain points are of the customer, right? Um, so I think that's really great. In terms of your clients, those who, the companies that are actually paying for the employment, can you mention some of them? Are they, are they, are the brands and companies that the general public would know? Are they too technical and maybe more B2B like, you know? Yes. I mean, we work with everyone from small bootstrap startups all the way up to Coinbase and Apple. Um, oh, there's, wow. there's and everything in between. I would say that when we started, our core customer were, of course, tech companies. But now we've evolved and everybody has some sort of, well, not everybody, I shouldn't generalize that much, but most businesses touch tech. And so we now service any, any, any company that's looking to hire software developers. And we're moving into, because we did it for ourselves, we realized we can successfully place people outside of software development. So we're doing uh, financial operational operational roles. We're doing customer service. We're doing marketing. We're doing sales. We're, I mean, you name it. But we're not heavily advertising that component yet. Fascinating. Um, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, those are huge companies. Apple, I mean, Swoon, that's like so cool that you have them as, as a client of yours and you're servicing them. Um, in terms of your, this is kind of a, a big kind of pivot in conversation. I'm thinking about, you know, one of the most impactful skill sets of an entrepreneur is to be able to kind of see what's what's up next, what's on deck, what's coming in the horizon. And with, you know, conversations about AI and the idea that a lot of um, the sophistication of what um, human beings have been able to do is going to be outsourced. Do you see that in the future develop that developers might be in competition with some of the technology that they themselves ironically created? Yeah, it, it's um yes and no. <laughs> it's going to evolve. The way that the way that software developers build product and build technology is is definitely going to evolve. I believe that there will be a lot of junior level roles um, that won't get filled the way that they used to get filled. I feel like it will get hard. It will be harder to break into tech. But I think the people that are in it right now are going to have more access. And the great thing about technology is that compounds and it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and more and more and more. And um, even if we might not be the builders ourselves, we will have to be the orchestrators. And so I, I, I see a world where there will be more unfilled tech roles than ever before, 
but what they do in their day-to-day is going to is going to change. That's really insightful. I love how you said we will be the orchestrators because I agree. I think I'm somebody that's not intimidated by technology. Like when it comes, um, maybe it's because the specific skills and the specific, um, I guess, value proposition that I have in the market with kind of sales and relationships. And, you know, we're always going to need relationships, human beings, networking, an ability to communicate value, right, interpersonally, because at the end of the day, we do business with each other. We can shake each other's hands. So like, because we need to know the trust, we need to have that trust equity to like, and speed of trust to make things happen. And so, because that's been my particular role, maybe I have this um, fortunate advantage to be like less intimidated than if I had a certain skill set that actually could be outsourced. But I also think that um, I, I, and this again could just be the convenience of my position, but I also think like embrace technology, like the best companies pivoted and, you know, those who didn't, who didn't say, they fought what is, right? Like there's a surrendering as an entrepreneur to be like, whatever it is, whether like the market or customer feedback loops are saying this isn't good or, you know, um, even even on a, on a vulnerable personal level, like my own shortcomings as a human being, my own shadow side or weaknesses as a person, as I go out in the world and engage to get that feedback loop to be like, wow, this is like a consistent, I'm the common denominator in this response from people around me, the world around me, it's telling me something about how I'm perceived and myself that I have to contend with. If I fight against it, it's going to end up not going well for me, you know? So like to me, when when new technologies and disruptions come on deck, to embrace them and run towards it and say, okay, this is what is. How do we pivot? How do we contort and utilize and, and embrace and go and flow with what is? And I just feel like that's a good recipe for success. I'd love your thoughts on that. It's like, especially as an entrepreneur, you know, you know, I I think I'm a very positive person just in general, the way I think about everything. Everything that's new or exciting, even if it's bad, it's good. I always find a way to make it good. And the way that I think about generative AI and the way that this is introducing and the way that ro- uh, computers are going to be able to build programs themselves without computer programmers, it's exciting to me because that just means more people have access and it levels the playing field in a way where anybody with an idea could potentially go and create a thing without having to depend on uh, another person that may not understand the thing you want to do exactly the same way you want to do it. I also think about it too, like when robotics were introduced into manufacturing, yes, that terrified a lot of people. And there was a lot of uh, protests going around being like, they're taking away our jobs. What are we going to do? How are we going to work and provide ourselves? And we just evolved. We evolved. We changed. There's more jobs than ever. In fact, like I'm more concerned about the fact that the boomers are about to all retire. The millennials will be promoted into senior management. And then the Generation Z doesn't want to be individual contributors. They all want to be content creators. They all want to be entrepreneurs, which is great. But like, we're about to have a massive shift in the whole workplace environment. There's a lot of changes happening, but it's exciting. It's exciting things. I think it's going to create more access and more opportunity. I love that. And so do you see yourself in the future as a business branching out of just developers and software and providing other services because of your unique ability to curate professionals and provide all these services in country like you are? Do you see you expanding in, in the vertical offering, so to speak? Yeah. So um, that's, exa- that's exactly right. And that's what we're doing right now. So um, we are testing it out with our existing customers where we're offering other different vertical roles like financial operations and customer service and sales and marketing and everything. And it's been very successful. So um, I think by the end of this year, we'll have enough data and validation that by the beginning of 2024, it will be something where we're no longer just software developers. We're connecting everything to, to everyone. Yeah, that's that's exciting. I think, you know, I'm curious because it's such a unique niche business you're in. And um, I, I'm sure listeners and people would be interested to know some of the mechanisms and the utility of some of how you've gone about, for example, advertising to secure talent. Like, where do you find, how do you have a clarion call for like, hey, we can help get you a job, you know, a job to these professionals in the developed world? What has been your strongest mechanism for securing talent? So I have always created this human-centric approach to recruiting. I think there's a lot of ways you can market. You can, of course, like advertise online. You can advertise on social. You can be an influencer. You can do all these things. 
but maybe I'm old school. I like in-person, face-to-face meeting people. So like when I first went down to Montevideo, I just met people for coffee and I like just reached out to them and said, hey, I'm here. I'd love to connect. And then I started having like little recruiting events and then we started doing meetups and we started doing talks. And the way I was thinking about it is like, I can't ask for something from them unless I give something to them. So what can I give where they will receive value, want to be a part of this? And then maybe I can say, and also here's how I can help in addition to that. So we started doing meetups, tech talks, hackathons, you name it, really just to give back into that community and be a core, just known name brand for, hey, these are where the software developers in Buenos Aires, they go and hang out. They've got this special club that they go to, they meet up, they hang, all of these like great leaders come and talk there. And what that did is it also gave us access to this network effect because smart people know other smart people and it blossomed that way. So anytime we go into a city, we really focus on what can we do to create a community. And of course, it's not just software developers that know other software developers, they know other folks as well. Um, and that's what we do. It's a very personal, even though we're a big company and we've expanded, it's a very personal feeling of a one-on-one relationship. Wow. I love that you're saying that because I'm such a believer in, um, you know, the, the first of all, the microcosm of individual relationship and then how that on a macro scale plays out. Like, you know, I come from a faith background and my belief of um, watching someone, you know, like Jesus, he's a, he, he's the guy that I'm, that I've, you know, pick to be on his team, but you know, he, what, you know, what, whatever your religious beliefs are, beliefs about Jesus, the application that he went deep in relationship with like 12 people, these 12 apostles, and then the impact that had on the scale. I just can't help but realize that in my own life, you know, um, sometimes cause I'm a, I'm a consummate networker. I love people. I collect people and I really enjoy meeting a lot of people. But the depths of relationships that I've had, the ones that I've got years and years and years of trust equity built where I really understand them, um, those are the ones where the greatest fruits are always given, just on a personal level and professional level, right? Because it's like, I know you and I know exactly how to put you where. And so I love that you have that relational-centric um, approach. Um, so I'm, I'm sure that that takes, well, I, would, I would say maybe like the long, short way to get things done, right? Like it's not a quick one and done, like you're really investing in these individuals but then the long-term payouts must be really beautiful. On the other side, how did you attract your your clients um, who actually, you know, then hire like the apples of the world? How did you how did you connect with them? So um, the same way, one-on-one relationships, deep relationships. My co-founder and I, uh, while I would like to think I'm young at heart, we've we've been in the world that we're in the tech word world for a minute, so we had great relationships there. And then we spread and grew so quickly through word of mouth referrals because we were able to l- deliver a service that they needed so badly. And then it was exceptional. And the word got out. Howdy has great talent. Like, don't waste your time with all of these other things. You don't have to worry about it with Howdy. It's the same. And so that that helped and played a very, very big role, too. And then, you know, Apple was lucky because we were working with a company and they got acquired by Apple. So through that acquisition, we were able to work with them. Coinbase was also another great, um, we got into Y Combinator. Y Combinator gave her a great social proof within the tech world, within the startup world. But there's a lot of great companies, a lot of great unicorn public companies that have come out of Y Combinator. So they heard about us through that. So That's phenomenal. So um, I love, again, that it was very relational, but also those are cool, like to get in, embedded in the network of say like a Y Combinator or like a platform where you can kind of have like a one-stop shop for a lot of relational potential. Um, it's very, very neat. Um, you are just so impressive. Like you're just a 10 out of 10 in communicating um, your voice and your articulation and your um, obviously the competence. You have this like humble, quiet confidence that I just think is infectious. How, how have you found um, being like, you know, as women in leadership, especially in the tech world where we know uh, the disparity is significant for women in leadership. How has that been for you? I mean, um, and what was it that shaped you that made you, I guess, be able to sit at the big boys table? You know, I mean, it's 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 a really real thing that a lot of women are facing right now of the dynamic, right, of how real that is. And I, I tend to um, maybe be I'm a political moderate, right? And so on my on my personal moral imperative, like I don't love when there's a lot of you know, 
I want to avoid any victimhood for myself and for the community around me. Like I want to, so as women, like, I'm like, Hey, create value and value is given, you know, like the free market doesn't lie. Like if you, like, I know as an entrepreneur, I don't, I don't care whatever your gender race or whatever is. I'm just going to, you bring me value. I'm going to copy. I'm going to create value back for you because this is a virtuous cycle. However, I have learned in time that there are, there is about a 9% that they've done the multivariate analysis about women. There's about a 9% gender bias and it comes from a lot of projections around how we're socialized. And also, um, you tend to hire the trust innately on a subconscious level, people that look and talk like you. And so when you're a man in leadership, you, th those biases will show up. And 9% is a serious thing, right? Like the rest of it has to do with a lot of other decisions of women being agreeable or to the careers they choose. Women tend to be more interested in people, not things, things scale, which creates more compensation. All these things are interesting. Women tend to not advocate for themselves in the same way. Women tend to be more, um, uh, balanced in their in their work-life balance and they tend to be caregivers at home with children and family members and extension of community and they're more relationally driven so those things are all at play but i will say that we just had a women's capita put on a women's gala in utah and we had 170 women and we invited just a couple men that were like executives of the sponsorship sponsors that came and some of our senior executives of um the men at our company were able to attend and our our one of the partners at our firm wrote this email that like made me tear up. It was really sweet. His name's Zach Call, and he said, "I just got to feel what you women feel like all the time." Where I walked in a room of 170 people that were in white dresses because it was a white theme party. And he's like, and I didn't look like any of them. And the awkwardness I felt of trying to make into conversations that were already happening, knowing how you know, I he goes, I felt the discomfort of being other and different. And he goes, that just. I got to feel what you ladies get to feel all the time. And I thought his empathy and theory of mind was so beautiful that he expressed it away. And I thought it made me tear up because he just honored us and said how real that was. And I thought, yeah, I think I sometimes take for granted how, how it is actually in the marketplace. So I'd love to hear your thoughts about being a woman in leadership and um, especially in the tech industry, how that's been for you or any ideas or advice you have to women listening or men listening to, to this podcast interview. I, uh, I have so many thoughts here. First, I want to thank you for those very, very kind words you said at the beginning. I, that's very, very humbling. I appreciate it. I, um, and you also brought up a lot of great points. And I think politically, we're probably very similar. Um, I might lean probably a little bit more left. But either way, I, I say things that maybe the people on the left side don't love as much either. Um, yeah. But I grew up uh, with <laughs> my co-founder and I call it immigrant mentality. So yeah. I was very fortunate to have a strong mom that immigrated here. And she very much from day one was like, you're a female. Everything's going to suck. Everything's going to be harder for you. Nothing is fair. And it is what it is. And she would not let me have a victim mentality. Now, you know, fast forward throughout my career, there were probably things I should have spoken up against or I should have spoken mm -hmm. out about. Mm -hmm. And there was horrible things that happened. Of course, you know, <laughs> this is, I, my career was 2008 until I started this company 2018. Like the height of Me Too came out, what, 2017, 2018? All yeah. the things people talked about. Yeah, Me Too. Of course, duh. Like that's just, it was yes. what it was. Um, but I think that the thing that's been so beautiful about being an entrepreneur is that I have received more respect in this role than any other role I've ever been a part of. And wonderful. When I was an employee, I think people just like naturally disregard you or naturally talk down to you or they patronize you or they don't. Even if you're a great employee, they're just going to assume you're going to continue to be a great employee. So I did allow myself to have a lot of and I, this I'm going to say this lightly, but I and I and I mean it lightly, but I did have a lot of abusive relationships where people would just say, oh, yeah, and get this to me by this. And I would stay up all night and work all morning. And then they would like shit on it. And I'd be like, OK, yes, sir. Thank you. I was just yes. this great yeah. employee that people like loved because I didn't ever set up, you know, healthy boundaries for myself. I got royally like screwed over one day and I was so, so upset by it that I was like, you know what? I'm so tired of making other people rich. I'm just going to go do it myself. And I knew that the VC world was stacked against me. And so I didn't ever have a dream of raising capital. I just, I'm going to go bootstrap this. I'm going to do it myself. I'm going to make money for myself. I'm never going to depend on anyone. And then yes, girl. <laughs> the business was working and we started growing. 
And the wild thing was, I was like, man, like we really, we really have an opportunity to make something here. We really have an opportunity to do something bigger than we could ever have dreamed. Let's try Y Combinator. And Y Combinator is great because like you said, you know, men will invest in men. Women will, you know, we, we see what we see. We know what we know. And I agree that Y Combinator is built with partners of all backgrounds, all, um, you know, male, female, different races. And so when you're going through that interview process, it is a very fair interview process, let's say. And we got in and that gave me the social proof I needed because at the end of demo day, I had 93 investors wanting to give me money. 93. Wow. Before Y Combinator, nobody even wanted to talk to me. It's just like, wow. it's, it's wild. Now, fast forward, I still deal with it every single day. Like I went, I was in Miami a month ago and um, I'm at this event invited by this company. They flew me in. They wanted me there. Like they didn't do that with anybody. And I meet this guy and he's this older guy. He's like, oh, honey, tell me about your company. And I tell him my company. And he's like, oh, sweetheart, let me tell you something. You're never going to get anywhere with that pitch. Let me tell you something. Like, like let's work on this pitch. Let's... <laughs> Little did this guy know, like my company is valued at a hundred million dollars. Like, what? I, I'm fine. I don't need your honeys and I don't need your babies. Um, yeah, <laughs> but, but I say this because, like, the person I was there with, one of my colleagues, was um, my head of operations, male, and he was so angry. He was, he was like, doesn't he know who you are? I'm like, who am I? I'm no one, right? But he's like, doesn't he know who you are? Doesn't he know? And he was so angry and it's so <laughs> much, like, vitriol that he was. And I was like, that's my power though, is like, I don't let people who patronize bother me. I don't let like, you, I can get so mad at so many things, but there's no, like this guy doesn't matter to me. There's nothing he can say that's going to fundamentally change anything except for put me in a bad mood or make me feel less about myself. So that's something I have changed over the last like five to 10 years is being able to be in control of what I choose to get mad at. And then the last thing I'll say that I think also put it in perspective for my husband is I actually don't like this whole like, oh, girl boss, boss babe, blah, 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 blah. And so I've actually been on a couple of podcasts where the guy's like, oh, how do you like being a girl boss or whatever? I'm so mad because I didn't have this retort back then, but I have it now. <laughs> so anytime yeah. someone brings that up to me, I'm like, well, you know, it's probably how you feel about being a boy boss. Like, does it feel great to be a boy boss? But people don't That's realize, awesome. right? Like they don't realize it is it, that comment in and of itself is degrading. Yes. And, I've and, never thought of that, quite frankly, Jacqueline, but you're so right. That's amazing. Right? So you, it's what? Well, yeah, sorry to interrupt you. I'm just no. like, ah. Every woman needs to have that response. Like that's because we then we just shut down the conversation about gender entirely. Let's just go forward as professionals. You know, I love yeah. that. And I and yeah. I think we should talk about it. And I, you know, I, I think I think we're getting too sensitive on things. I think it's important yeah. to be observant and recognize. And I think it's important that we have our thoughts and we can share them. Like. All of the things that happened, you know, in my earlier careers, no, that that wasn't okay. And I should have been like empowered to be able to speak to it. And so I'm so glad yes. we've had this movement. But mm -hmm. I don't think it I don't think it negates this. Uh, I, I what advice I would give women is don't let yourself be a victim. Just yes, you are. But there's no reason to because it's only going right. to hurt yourself. That's the way I think yes. that's used to. Oh, I love this. You are, you, we need you on every panel and every podcast and every, you know, any way that your voice can be heard because I think we need to have this conversation from a different lens. I, I do agree. I, I can't be ungrateful for the women that have let out and calling out the toxic behavior and the disparity and the issues, right? Like those movements have brought forth the, and we're standing on the shoulder of giants, so to speak, yes. of like now because of it, we, I mean, hundred years ago, women couldn't vote. I mean, my no. goodness, you know what I mean? So right. it's like, you know, we couldn't own property. We couldn't, you know, so it's like there absolutely has all of that as a foundation and not to disregard it or not to say how important it is and not to say there isn't still disparity. Like I come from the state of Utah, although I live in Hawaii now and Capita Financial Network, our company is based there. And we are number 50 out of the 59 states of gender equality on scales of metrics, professional and compensation and all that. 
And it doesn't surprise me at all. But I do think if we don't get honest about what is going back to that surrender to the facts and the truth will set you free. Like if we don't get honest, a lot of that in Utah is because of, you know, social and religious undertones where women choose to not be in the workplace. Right. Or if they they do, they've been out of the workplace from having six children on average or whatever, five children. I don't know what the Utah average is, but it's way higher than the national and international average of childbirth. So these, these women are choosing different choices. And to just assume that they all are because of the patriarch and someone made them and not to say that maybe this is what they want from their lives. You know what I mean? I love that now we can have conversations that are going from the polarization to more of a nuanced view. And, you know, I think if we can do that, then then the issues where they really where we really do need to tackle it, where we hold it in its totality and say there is gender bias, there is an appropriate behavior. Yeah. We do need to feel empowered. That can be served so much better than when you when Oftentimes, and especially social media and the zeitgeist of our current culture is just like those in the most extremes are the ones that are the loudest. And it's so, I'm, I think people are so sick of it. We need to have yeah. conversations. We can say things that maybe aren't popular to say and say, no, I actually, I disagree, you know, because yeah, in my experience, I mean, you know, I've had women be like, well, how did you get there? Like, you know, da, da, da. and I was like, or even just like you have this earned confidence. I was sitting here looking at you and taking you in and just like having this girl crush. And I'm like saying to myself, how does Jacqueline has gotten this confidence through hard work and earning it. She didn't, she didn't just materialize it because she read some book by Deepak Oprah. You know, <laughs> like, he, he got this from years and years of slaving in the trenches and hard yeah. work of learning and ideating and you paid for it. And so now you have results to say, I can sit in this room with Gravitas because I've done it. I've earned this. Nobody has to tell me that I'm enough because I know I am. And I think a lot of times the feminist movement will just kind of this rah, rah, you know, you're amazing. And, and we all are in, inherently valuable, every woman. But like, if you want a certain prize, like it's go you're going to have to pay dividends. You know, you're going to have to pay, sorry, to get the dividends. You're going to have to yep. pay into and deposit. And so I think having conversations like that where a lot of women, it's like, did you, you know, if it's, why wouldn't it be a meritocracy in the free market? Like, don't you want the best surgeon to, you know, save your baby's life? Don't you want the most competent professionals to be at the helm of a business that employs millions of people? Don't you want for the economy to boom? Well, competence yields that. So let's go. You know, this is the sport. It's a high contact sport. And to say that, well, we, it's unfair, I, that less women at the top inherently like or whatever, you know, let's let's be really honest, like it should be highly competitive and women can step up and by nurturing them to say, you know what, there's other we get to see models and all of that. That again, it's the paradox of these truths, these two truths that simultaneously land. But I love that you're saying that do get to talk a lot to people because I mean, you're magnificent. So like and you have the success, you get a lot of chances to to share your perspective. It, you know, just in the marketplace. You know, uh, for people who ask, I do, but I don't think I, I don't think I, I share it a lot. No, I don't. I don't have a lot of um, experiences in terms of like talking. We just started. I've been very heads down for the last five years mm -hmm. and building. <laughs> already, yeah, starting the last three months was when I came up for air. And that's when I started doing more on social media. I've started posting more on LinkedIn. I'm starting to yeah. be invited into podcasts. So thank you for having me. Yeah. But, oh, yeah, so fun. I would say no. <laughs> but I, yeah, I'm well, moving in that direction of yes. Yes. Oh, good. And yeah. And I think that's, uh, that's, I hopefully you come in that season more because you'll be such a gift, not only to women, but to men as professionals where they get to hear your perspective. It's, it's so nuanced and so, um, just clear. You're just so clear. So that's really fun. Um, so Jacqueline, tell me a little bit about, you know, as you're in this journey of growth, now you've got this valuation you're having, and you're looking for the next growth. Are you learning that some of the ways you got here as a scrappy entrepreneur in a startup mode and, you know, this Herculean effort, are you having to learn that some of the things you did in the past are no longer serving you and that they actually become maladaptive in the next phase of your growth? And can you share any insights about that? Because I think a lot of people might be just, you know, behind you in their trajectory of their business and maybe want to gain any insights you have. Yes. Learn this thing for me because I, I had to learn this the hard way. We had a lot of momentum with word of mouth referrals on the commercial side, the sales side. And I mistook that for repeatable sales success. And 
we were growing like gangbusters. The recession imploded. There was massive amounts of layoffs, but we still had so much demand that it offset the layoffs. And so, again, we we still had false signals of success and false signals of we were doing things that we thought were process. And now coming into, gosh, what, Q3 of 2023, we are realizing that we didn't have repeatable sales processes. And what I mean by that is, can we consistently say we're going to do X number of outbound contacts or X number of emails or X number of calls and X number of this? And and can we dial it up and dial it down in a way that's going to get us a consistent amount of success? And um, the answer was no. Like if I really, really could look at myself in the mirror and say, did we do that successfully or not? We didn't. We We were really good at executing things that were brought to us, but we weren't good at filling the top of the funnel. So we have spent the last six months figuring out how do we fill up the top of the funnel repetitively, repeat, like, repeatedly in a way that creates the same results. And we are just now starting to see the fruit of that, which I'm very excited about it. But there's this great book called The Ultimate Sales Machine. Um, I read it. I read it five years ago. I had to reread it again because I, I did it at the beginning of my business. We lost sight of it. And I'm, I'm back at it. The other thing that I learned was that when I was leading sales, when I was doing the sales, a founder reaching out to another founder or a CEO reaching out to another CEO, you're l- way more likely to get a response than if you're a business development rep or if you're an SDR or if you're a salesperson. And so a lot of the things that I was doing that I was like, oh, just do this, just do this. This is going to make it. And they didn't do it. I was like, you're supposed to be following my formula, but then I didn't put it in the perspective of, but they are not me. And people respond, to me and my co-founder differently than they would respond to them. So I actually had to go back to the drawing board and pretend to be not myself. I made up a name. I made up a job like title. Wow. So that I could see, okay, what is it that's going to work? (laughs) And um, and that's what we did. That's really cool. I want to hear more about that. That is innovative and just like that is just scrappy and guerrilla style, (laughs) you know, business. I love it. So tell me a little bit about um, what what the outcomes were? Were you you so you went under this alias and you're just like okay I'm not I'm no longer the co-founder and I'm not me. How people respond? What did you learn? Were the hacks that actually had outcomes you could take back to your your team? You know the I think that I was depending on the fact that if I was if it was me as the founder and CEO emailing my open rates were higher my replies rates were higher meaning that they were at least giving me the courtesy to respond and say, hey, you know, not right now, let's not meet or, or, or what have you. Um, when I was my alias, it very quickly was able to tell me, hey, that subject line that I thought was a great subject line actually doesn't have a great open rate. Or like the content that I, I thought had a great reply rate, it wasn't actually the content. There was more power in who was the one sending it than what was being said. And so just like some quick takeaways, uh, People hate email. People hate LinkedIn. Everybody's being bombarded with everything. I had to show my salesperson, yeah. hey, look at my LinkedIn inbox. Don't send an email. Look at, I scrolled through like all of the messages I get every single day and his mind yes. was blown. I don't think people realize how no. bombarded we are. And so I was, what I found, and of course it's obvious, keep it short and sweet. Keep it short and simple. Don't even try and sell yourself. Just try and make a connection. If you can make a connection, yeah, something other than what it is that you're doing, getting them to open and respond to the first email is the hardest. But once yeah. they've done that, even if it's a no, it's a much, much easier lead to follow up with later with maybe more information, more relevant information. Again, even if they're not interested, you can also politely like, hey, you know, we do this. Like one of the things I said was we are involved in a uh, workplace, depending on the person I was sending it to, like um, what inspires you know, this new hybrid type of work. Do you want some of the research? Would you like me to share some of the research as we come across it? And nine times out of 10, people say, yeah, they want to know, they want to hear. And so I would just start to like share them insights as we're learning, sending it to them, sending it to them. And what ended up happening was they would come back and come to me instead of us selling to them. Oh, hey, by the way, actually, we are looking for someone. Are you able to help? People aren't dumb. They see your email address. They go to your website. They know what you're going to do. They know what you're doing. You send them copying your market, marketing collateral, they know, you know, you don't need to sell them an email. So provide value first. They always, they always come back. Well, that not is, always, but you know, a lot of them do. Really yeah. great. These are amazing insights in any industry. I mean, this is just 
cool hacks. Um, so we have just a couple more minutes left. So I'm maybe like leaving it a little bit open. What would you, sh what do you want to share with people who are um, just, you know, being entrepreneurs and or, and or people that are trying to advance in their own goals, their own curview for their ambitions for whatever it is they're creating in the world. You know, I mean, there's so many human um, universal truths, you know what I mean, that we learn along the way. But you're somebody who just obviously has a, a really big heart, the optimistic view. Um, you know, I thought about there's this uh, research recently I read about that people who kind of have a more op optimistic view and tend to be um, more grateful or consider themselves, quote, lucky, actually, um, ironically, see things. There's like an, an actual ability to have eyes to see and ears to hear different things. Really? Um, you know, and um, the, the research was done by some behavioral psychologists that actually had a bunch of people. They had a cohort of people that considered themselves unlucky and then people who considered themselves lucky and they made them read through like a 20 page newspaper. And they said, please count how many pictures you see in the newspaper. Those who saw themselves as lucky um, essentially stopped in 30 seconds because on the second or third page of the newspaper uh, periodical, there was like actually said, there's this many pictures in, in the newspaper. Like it gave the answer. And those who saw themselves as unlucky didn't see the the copy and went through and counted every one. Isn't that so fascinating? So we're learning something about the brain of like your ability to like see that I'm lucky. And it might have to do with this theory of mind that like the world is good. And so I have a more open aperture and a, a positive purview. I we don't understand it. But I thought that was fascinating. But I'm thinking somebody like you with your your optimistic um, virtues and your and your kind of way of being in the world. What would be the big advice, maybe something that you want to share with our listeners about, you know, how to make it through all of the times that are hard or how to get through whatever they're going through as they're trying to scale up their proverbial mountain? <laughs> oh, man, I've got so many stories, so many different things I could share on this, like one topic alone. Tell a story, anyone um, you want. We love. OK, so here's a fun one. You said you're from Utah yeah. and that, you know, a lot of women don't work because they have six kids. I have six kids. Really? Believe it or not. Oh, my gosh. I do. I have I have uh, four bonus kids mm -hmm. and I have two of my own. And so all together, we're like a fun Brady bunch. And I was bootstrapping this company. Um, and I had saved up a bunch of money to do it. Well, not saved up. I, I decided to use my life savings for it. And um, fast forward to March of 2020, we were just about to break even. And I had put 100% of my savings into this business. And I was down to $400, period. 400 of everything. I had been right? 15 years of working, $400 to my name. And I was eight and a half months pregnant with my first son myself and I COVID happened every single customer of ours basically put everything on pause everything went on hold and my baby shower which I was like so desperate for those items got canceled and I'm just like oh my gosh I have this baby coming into the world oh. I have this company that's about to fail and tank though everybody's paused everything's happening and I tell you like I somehow remembered that I had this like savings account that I had hid from myself when I was younger. And I just like out of nowhere remembered. I'm like, Citizens Bank, why does that name sound familiar? I log in and there was like $2,000 or $3,000 there. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is, I'm like, you know, like you said, like luck. I was like, yes, like this is a sign. <laughs> like keep going. And then like, and then, you know, of course, we had a mortgage and I didn't know how I was going to pay the mortgage. And then it came out where it was like, you can defer your mortgage payment for three months without any kind of like fault or penalty. I was like, am I in this like, like uh, virtual reality where someone's playing and they're just like messing with me right now? Because like all of these things are happening. Wow. And I kept feeling I'm like, no, I'm so lucky. These are all signs to like continue to persevere. And then sure enough, I had my son. It was still a very stressful, hard time. But then like it was right after that like very, very stressful moment where a couple lucky things like allowed me to stay in business that right after that we took That's off so and great. everything exploded. That's and so, so like the advice I always tell my friends that are entrepreneurs is there will be tests out there that will think you need to fold. And it's usually in those moments 
where you have to just drive through yes, yes. because I think the universe is challenging you yes. or whatever your higher power is to see if it's something, if you're worthy of it. And that's usually when most people stop. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, that was an amazing story. And I love it. There's like something, you know, metaphysical, magical about it. And those are so fun. Those are so memorable. But um, what I really heard from you was just this resilience, this like, you know, looking for any way to make it work. I mean, what a what a powerful um, test of your character, I guess, when really pushed, um, pushed when push comes to shove or to be, a, you know, your, your breaking point. I just was like, wait a minute, you've built all this and you have six children. Like, are you literally, do you have a cape on? Like, what is happening? Jackson, anyway, I just, there's no doubt in my mind that you as a mother of six would be such an inspiration to people in your community and to your family and to your spouse. And um, you certainly are me. So thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your remarkable insight. I just hope we get to to hang out in person and, and do more um, FaceTime and, you know, opportunity to because we know you, you're just a total powerhouse. So in a force of nature. So thank you, Jacqueline. It was so wonderful having you on. Do you need help with the next steps for your financial plan? Think Capita. Capita is a financial network built around you. They have a team of financial advisors, CPAs, estate attorneys, Medicare providers, and social security experts to help you accomplish your financial goals. Call to schedule a complimentary consultation at 801-566-5058 or visit their website at www.capitafinancialnetwork.com. You can also check out their financial education podcast, The Financial Call, available on Apple, Google, Spotify, and YouTube.